Please turn over to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and we'll begin there. Much of what I have to say this afternoon will be coming out of the Old Testament. <clears throat> we'll be looking here in a moment at Genesis 3, starting with verse 1, but beginning at another place to introduce that. You'll remember in your study of the New Testament that Satan asked to have Simon Peter. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired, the American Standard 1901 says, asked, to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Luke 22, verse 31. That word sift, S-I-F-T, is the translation of the Greek word siniazo, which means to shake in a sieve, to sift by trial and temptation. Now with regard to Job, that righteous man of old, when God drew Satan's attention to Job, God said to Satan, concerning him, a number of things, and then finally got to this, Behold, he, that is Job, is in thy Satan's hand, but save his life. Job 2, verse 6. Peter, writing to Christians, said, Be sober. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom withstand steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are accomplished in your brethren who are in the world. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. And during his earthly ministry, our Lord said to certain Jews, Ye are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, it is your will to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and standeth not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father thereof. John chapter 8 verse 44. Now that sets the stage for us to go back to Genesis chapter 3, and I want to read, American Standard Version, verses 1 through 8. Verses 1 through 8, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were opened, both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice or sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now let's study this and see something I think sometimes it's missed. It is a great 
lesson on what may be the greatest sin any of us could commit uh, is presented to us. Well, God places Adam and Eve sinless in this Garden of Eden. And there were marvelous privileges that they had in that garden. And I doubt in our state of affairs today, so governed by sin and the consequences of sin and the impact of sin, that we could ever fathom what they underwent as sinless people in the garden, fitted for sinless people. But in that garden, there were certain restrictions that God placed on them. With regard to the tree in the midst of the garden, God said, don't eat of it. He just plainly said, thou shalt not eat of it. He tells them why. For the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, Genesis 2.17. Well, we have the devil presented to us by means of the serpent. And he comes into the garden. I do not believe that we should think of the devil at this, or the serpent, I should say, at this time, as we think of a snake today, because after the curse, you can see that God changed him. That is the serpent. But nevertheless, uh, the devil comes, but he comes in the form of a serpent. However, the serpent's image was before sin was in the world. And in all of his characteristic subtlety, and that's important to understand about how the devil works, he approaches the woman. She could have been there alone or not very far from him. That is Adam, her husband. But be that as it may, why did the Satan approach her? Why didn't he approach Adam? Paul said later on, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. That ought to cause us to think a little bit because he has a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Sometimes to get to one person, you go through another person. And when you think of the reason woman was made, the attitude that Adam had toward her, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and that she was created especially as a suitable help for the man. You see that Satan knew that about as well as anybody did. Maybe better than Adam did. Well, he begins, that is Satan does, with an insinuating question. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, now why would he raise that question? He knew very well. And the woman responded, and God said, no such thing, in effect. She then explained what God had said, and we have Moses' inspired explanation that she gave. The serpent simply says, ye shall not surely die. Why would he do that? Well, you say he wants her to break God's law but there's something he's got to do to her to get her to violate God's law after all she quoted right back to him what God told him he must remove fear of punishment from her now I want to pause here and say this about the society in which we live that's what's happened to a great extent among a lot of religious people and certainly secular materialistic people all around us. There is no fear of people having to answer for their deeds. Notice the serpent continues, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What's he saying? What's well, right the opposite of what God told you? There are great rewards in this for you. And thus we learn one of the ways that Satan operates. He gets us to question God to such a point that really God didn't mean what he said and he's really holding back things from us that would be good for us and if you do this, it'll be a great thing for you. 
So the devil questioned the goodness of God is in effect what he did and caused her to doubt the goodness of God because his goodness was questioned in restricting them. He really is not showing proper concern for you. And how many times do we hear people saying, why did God allow this to happen to me? The truth of the matter is, when bad happens to a person, it's not God, it's the devil. I've never understood why they didn't say, look what the devil did to me. When you see these wars and these famines, is that the fault of God? No, it's the fault of sin. And the devil's the father of that. He questioned the severity of God. God won't really punish you. He questioned the very motive of God. In other words, God just really doesn't want you to have what you really should have. Does that sound like a, a spoiled child trying to get their way with their parents? And they know their parents don't want them to do something or would want them to do a certain thing. They don't want to do it. What's happening is that the devil is slandering God. And you know, we had a lesson not long ago on slander. He's lying about God. He's slandering God. Now, in dealing with Job, it's interesting to see that the devil slandered man to God. Remember how he did it? Well, he doesn't, he doesn't serve you because you're God and only because you're God. In other words, does God. Job serve you for nothing you pay him. That's how God lets him approach him. He said, all right, you can have this much power over him. And, of course, he finally ended up letting him have another round at him, let him even touch his body, so to speak, and cause all manner of problems with him. Lost about everything men of this world love. His own wife said, curse God and die. Point is, he curses and slanders and reproaches God to man, and to man he reproaches the man to God. So on, back and forth. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Now that's simply her dependence upon her own fleshly appetite and desires of human beings. The woman gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now you'll notice that the man was not tempted as was Adam. In fact, Paul will say to Timothy, the woman was tempted in the transgression. Well, who's the head of the race of mankind? It's Adam. And that's who he's after, folks. But he knows exactly how to get to Adam. Because Adam just goes into this sin, his eyes wide open. But Eve was solicited to do evil through temptation. And she gave in. The Bible teaches that the transgression of God's law in the paradise of Eden, the devil was successful in his efforts both physical and spiritual. Thus, you find Romans 5 and verse 12, we studied not long ago under Ken's leadership, that that's how it entered into the world. That is how sin entered into the world. And as a consequence of this transgression of God's law or sin, every person is born into a world where sin is and where death is because death is the result of sin doesn't mean that we inherited the actual original sin of Adam and Eve. It means that we're born into a world where sin exists. And the consequences of sin, the ultimate, is separation from God, Romans 3.23 and 6.23. When Adam and Eve then partook of the, what we always call as the forbidden fruit, God forbade them from doing it, but they did it anyway, We recognize that a very great and very terrible sin was committed. But that's not the sin I'm talking about. I think that you can read this and maybe begin to see, if you think about it, even greater sin. 
The sin that would be greater than this was committed when Adam and Eve listened to the voice of the devil, the voice of the serpent. That was his instrument to get their attention. Words are signs of ideas. He put his ideas in their head. Why would they listen? Why would you stand there and listen to all that? Why didn't you just walk away? But she subjected herself to what she couldn't handle. Now, as we think about the matter of listening to the voice of the serpent or the voice of the devil through the serpent, I want us to consider a few things because we're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. First of all, consider the very nature of it. I imagine it was quite a pleasing voice. I doubt it sounded like a, a hyena about to eat something up. Sin is alluring. It's heard at times that are most advantageous. The devil gets what he wants. It can be heard in places where it would not ordinarily be expected such as pulpits, or a wife, or a husband, or a husband, and, or father, or mother, whoever. It, it comes to us from the people that we may be the closest to and think the highest of. Satan knows that better than we do. It'll, it'll usually begin with some sort of insinuating question. Well, that's mom and daddy. They wouldn't ask me to do something to be wrong. And so on you go. And it'll likely attempt to remove any and all fear. Satan works well in places that seem to be so secure to us. And you can be sure there'll be rewards offered for violating God's will. All of these things are taking our, making us take our armor off. And there will probably be an element of truth in it. It's like when people are overtaken in a trespass, we're as faithful members told to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Well, he didn't say let him completely go into error to the point where he announces the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the Bible, and anything spiritual before you act. We just don't seem to understand that in all my years of preaching it seems to me that's one of the greatest failures of the average member of the church we think they have to be totally apostate before we get very concerned much about anything and yet we're told all along regarding the physical body about cancer early detection means more of a chance to get rid of it but coming to the soul no you actually make people mad to say, where were you Sunday? We missed you at worship. When should you ask that question of a person? After they've been gone two or three years. You see one little thing done where something's changed in the worship, something changed in the organization of the church, changed from the authority of God's good word. One little thing, oh, it's just a little thing. Well, when do you get concerned about these things? You get concerned the first time you see sin. The nature of sin brings grief and pain and sorrow and suffering and anxiety to all those who listen to the voice of the serpent. And it often causes the innocent people to suffer. It often causes one to want to try to hide from God. That's exactly what they did when they sinned. Well, that's the nature of the voice of the serpent. Consider with me then the, the when, the when, W-H-E-N, the when of it. Where we're listening to the voice of the serpent. It's very simple. When you're tempted to disregard or to violate any part of the Word of God. 
When you're tempted to violate your own conscience, you're not sure whether you've got authority from God to act or not, but you go ahead and do it anyway, which can't be out of faith because you're unsure of the Word of God, and faith comes by hearing the Word of God, but we act anyway. When we're tempted to disregard or to criticize parental guidance, parental judgment, When we're tempted to disregard or criticize parental authority or even civil authority. And I'm not talking about where your parents tell you to sin and you go out and murder somebody because that's what they want you to do. Or steal for them or lie for them. I heard. I don't think this brother will remind him because I'm going to call his name. He said he had a doctor tell him recently that since he, in his situation, was going to have to pay more money as far as a certain matter was concerned. And the recommendation was, well, just go tell him you got a problem with your hearing. And they'll keep you from having to do that. Well, <laughs> that's a lie if you do that. But what does that tell you about people? When mothers stand in front of our snow cone stand and the kid wants something where the kid can't read, well, there it is. It's what they want, but rather than say, you can't have it, the mother just simply says, they don't have it. Now, they'll do it then. They'll do it even bigger way later on. So we train. We train up people in the wrong way as well as the right way they should go. So when we're tempted to argue the littleness of a thing, I've heard that all my life as a preacher. And often what seems to be so little is not little at all. And we studied some about that this morning. What's big is what God says is big. And what God, what's little is what God says is little. When we're tempted to be more concerned about pleasing self than about pleasing God. I know more than you do about saying so I shut up. Now people may not say that. But in their minds, they think that. When you're tempted to argue, I just can't see any harm in it. When you're tempted to argue, everybody's doing it. When you're tempted to think no one will ever find out about this. That's a serpent talking. When you're tempted to argue that, well, this is not as bad as whatever that is you're going to compare it to. And when you're tempted to accept the doctrine that it really doesn't make any difference what you believe just as long as you're sincere. See, if that doctrine were true, he would not have been all right because Satan persuaded her that that's okay. And she was sincere in the violation of God's will. Sincerity? Yes, but sincerely wrong. When you're tempted to accept the doctrine that after all, we really don't have to be completely obedient to God's will since salvation is a matter of God's grace. In other words, God is so loving and full of favor that regardless of what you think, say, or do, as long as you're saying, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll serve you the best I can here, but you know I can't do much. And then you go on your way doing pretty much what you please and God's grace is going to cover that. If that's the case, why did Paul write to Christians who understood and obeyed the gospel, reminding them of when they became Christians in Romans 6, and ask, what shall we say, say then? Shall we continue in grace that, in sin that grace may abound? Paul is saying there what we studied last Sunday morning. When you obey the gospel from the heart, you're resolving in every step when understood that from here on out to the best of my ability, I will never go back on God again. That's conversion. And a person's baptism is worthless if they haven't believed in Christ and repented of their sins. Because repentance is where you die to the habitual, prolonged practice of sinning against God and not caring. Also, when you're tempted to question the goodness of God, why did God do this to me? When you're tempted to question the severity of God, well, he won't surely do this to me. Look at all the other good stuff I've done. 
when you're tempted to question the motive of God. Why did he ever put me here in the first place? Well, what's the proper response? I won't read all of this, but I urge you to do it because it was written four times for your learning and my learning. And that's Numbers 22 and the account of Balaam. The Israelites were encamped along in the plains of Moab. This is before they cross over to the land of Canaan. And there's a king there over the Moabites by the name of Balak. And he wanted Balaam, who was a prophet, to come to him and to condemn the Israelites. And the king, Balak, sent messengers to obtain the services of the prophet Balaam. And he offered Balaam great rewards if he would do what he wanted him to do. Well, Balaam was one of these that would make a good American in a lot of cases. He just could not stand firm. The dollar bills waved in his front of his eyes, and they were just too much for him. He would not stand firm on what he knew to be the case or to be true about these people. So Balaam gave them lodging, and he said, I'll bring you word again. Now note something about this. There are some things one just does not take time to think over. And there are some people we do not want to entertain at all. And he knew this, Balaam did. What did he have to think over? Have you ever noticed how we'll do that sometime? Well, let me think about this for a while. We know when we say that, we're going to figure out a way of turning them, whoever it is down on whatever they're requesting, but we want to do it in a way it just won't look so bad. Or we just hate to really come out and shut the door completely in their face and say, no, <laughs> there's got to be this whatever it is that makes us tools of Satan. So Balak sent messengers again. And he sent more of them this time. So they were more honorable. And he upped the price. I will do whatsoever thou sayest to me. The temptation is getting stronger. But never does there come from Balaam, leave me alone, I'm not going to do it, don't want to see you here again. And eventually Balaam went to Balak and he sought to condemn the Israelites. But you'll remember that God changed his uh, words into a blessing. And in this matter, Balaam lost the favor of the king, but he also lost the favor of God. Now, when Balaam thought, when you read this, he seemed thinking upon the invitation. And he thinks about, well, look at what I'm going to receive. Look at these great rewards. You know who he's listening to? Same one that Eve listened to. He's listening to the voice of the serpent. And you have to go all the way over to Numbers 31a to find out what finally happened to him, and he was slain in battle. Now that tells you how Satan operates because he hasn't stopped operating that way. But now look at another one. All these accounts written four times for our learning to help us in understanding the teaching of the New Testament. And we'll look at Joseph, Genesis chapter 39. You'll remember, making a long story a little shorter, that once Joseph got into Egypt, he was finally placed in charge of Potiphar's household. And this gave a certain wicked woman, Potiphar's wife, opportunities to try to seduce Joseph. And she was relentless. And she pleaded with Joseph. She said, how, uh, Joseph said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, that tells me so much about this man's character, about his background, what he had been taught, his concept of right and wrong, and that you can't compromise the right. You can't yield when it might seem the easiest thing to do. The record simply says he 
hearken not unto her. Why couldn't Balaam have done that? And why couldn't Eve have done that? Now from the devil's viewpoint, the circumstances were good. He had an agent of sin ready and willing to do his bidding. And the appeal would be about one of the strongest possible among mankind. But he has a character that is pristine and pure and dedicated to God and will not compromise when it comes to Joseph. And aren't you glad we have people like that in the Old Testament as examples for us as to how we should approach and stand for the truth of Jesus in the New Testament? He is a faithful servant of God and all that the Bible means by such a thing. And he would not listen to the voice of the serpent through the allurements of that woman. Well, that comes down to us. What good is all this to you and to me to help me walk the straight and narrow way of truth and to not let Satan overcome us? Well, it means I've got to deal with the voice of the serpent. He hasn't stopped doing what he always did. Now, will I deal with him as did Joseph or as did Balaam? And we must know that Satan is ever anxious, as it were, to speak to us, to influence us. He does everything he can to get our attention and say, I've got something you can't get from anywhere else. I would think that in salesman's school, salesperson's school, I ought to study the way Satan sells what he's got and apply it to good things. We must know well the nature of his voice, do we? We must learn to recognize what he has to say to us. And we must determine to react always in harmony with the will of God. And here's one of the biggest. We must understand in understanding the nature of what he says and what he has to say that it may be coming from mama or daddy or wife or husband or child or the boss on the job or people we count as dearest friends who don't even know they are in the position of a serpent and being used by the devil. We have the obligation, as the New Testament tells us in James 4 and verse 7, 1 Peter 5, 9, to resist him. To stand against him. We're told plainly, you do that and he'll flee from you. And we must imitate the Lord when he was tempted. Matthew chapter 4. He answered him with scripture. Well, the truth of God's word was in the character of Joseph and that's how he dealt with it. But he was in the patriarchal age. Of course, he didn't have the word we have today in the New Testament. But Satan hasn't changed his approach. Whether it's appealing to people in the world to keep them in the world and have them never obey the gospel. Or whether it's people in the church who he does not have. And I assure you, he wants us. And you remember how we started out the whole lesson. How that Jesus tells Peter, and Peter doesn't even know this. Simon, Simon. Satan hath desired or asked to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. I read that and I think about it, and I wonder, has Satan tried that on John, or my wife, or me, or you? I promise you he has. And God is saying through Christ in the New Testament, that's what he does. And here's how you resist him and I promise you, if you do, he will flee from you. Thus, you can see that in Jesus applying all of this. When it comes to Peter, he's trying to tell them, the Son of Man must go up to Jerusalem, and there he'll be put to death by the chief priests and the scribes. And Peter said, Oh, no, far be it from you, Lord. What's the Lord telling? Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things of God but the things of men. 
Satan's talking through you. Trying to get me, the only one who can save you, the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And he's trying to get you to stop me from doing the only thing that can save even you and all others who will be saved. So that's Satan talking. So Eve learned the hard way, the tragic, terrible, terrible consequences of listening to the voice of Satan. She learned that disobedience is disobedience even when you've been deceived. She learned that not all which are pleasing to the eyes are things which are good. Well, our young people need to learn that. It kind of sounds like all that glitters is not gold. She learned that God's goodness and God's mercy, now listen, did not preclude his justice. She learned the sin of engaging in and partaking of that which God has not authorized. Also of doing what God had explicitly in this case forbidden. We need to turn your, our hearts and turn our minds as soon as we recognize we're listening to the voice of Satan. And turn to listen to the voice of the Lord as it's set out in the words of his last will and testament. So it's no wonder that when you read the seven churches of Asia, letters written to each one of those. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. And the only way you'll learn how to become a Christian is from the New Testament of Christ. The only way you'll learn how to be restored if you fall away because you listened to the voice of Satan and did what he said or didn't do what you should do is to repent of sins and confess them and pray God for forgiveness. There must be on your part a willing to determine to do right. Think of Joseph and what he did. How can I do this great sin before God? We cannot afford to let the voice of Satan keep us from becoming a Christian, keep us from being restored to our first love, and keep us from living day to day under the authority of Christ and being godly. Greatest sin in the Garden of Eden, what was it? That they partook of the forbidden fruit? The question needs to be asked. What went on in their minds, Eve's mind in particular, before it ever came to that? And she listened. She did not flee temptation. That's why you have such a strenuous comment and warning made to Christians about false teachers. Listen, and you'll see exactly, and you've heard it many times before, how we should deal with with those who are false teachers. That is, they're Satan's mouthpieces. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now listen. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, Receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Doesn't that pretty well sum up everything we've been trying to say and what has happened ever since the Garden of Eden? The greatest sin in Eden, listening to the voice of Satan. If you're not a child of God, we plead with you, we beg of you to obey the gospel this afternoon. And don't listen to the voice of Satan. He's going to tell you somewhere or the other right now, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, he's telling you something that says you don't have to arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. Something's going on right now. It's clicking in your mind. Well, if it's contrary to the scripture you know is God's will, who's talking to you? The serpent is speaking. As a child of God, if you see sin in your life, you listen to him and you thought, well, it's not that bad. Or I can take care of it. 
No, as soon as you know it's there, repent of it, turn from it, and pray God for forgiveness. Are we assured of tomorrow? No. We have right now to take care of matters with God. Don't listen to the voice of Satan. So if you need to obey the truth of God Almighty, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.